Hey everyone, welcome back to Epic Tomorrows. I'm now talking to, it's now my, now my pleasure to talk to Aaron L. Sabrut, is that pronounced right? Yep. Yeah. Um, who is a transgender Egyptian American lawyer, writer, and artist living on unceded. Now, I'm not quite sure how to say this. St could you pronounce it for me? Saminas. Saminas Territory, okay, otherwise known as Vancouver Island in Canada. Um, he believes in planting seeds for collective liberation through action, relationship, policy, and literal seeds, which is cool. He researches prison abolition and law, working to make the law a tool for abolition um, and incarcerated folk. I find that really fascinating. Really looking forward to talking about that. Um, currently, Aaron works for Black and Pink, an open family of over 20,000 incarcerated LGBTQIA 2S plus and also HIV plus folk and their open world collaborators. Um, in his free time, he is usually to be found writing or pottering around in the garden. <laughs> um, and also I should say, this is part of the um, introduction to social ecology intro series of interviews of, of yeah, fellow classmates on, on that course that we just finished together. Um, so yeah, thanks so much for joining us. First yeah, thing. thanks for having me, Matthew. It's really fun. We're actually recording this during the class time. So it yeah, feels right, like right, a yeah. nice continuity because the really. class just ended last week. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely, yeah. Um, it was really nice for me to have a bit. Of, I was sort of really enjoying the free time today and kind of half wondering why I had so much free time. And then I remember this because usually <laughs> I'm preparing for the class. So yeah, um, if we could start with uh, why or what brought you to, broadly speaking, what brought you to the social ecology course? Um, why were you interested in it? That's not- Yeah, I think I specifically found the class through like Reddit or something. It yeah. was just like a totally random internet link that I followed. But I think that like, the idea of green anarchism broadly and what, what I would describe as like decolonial anarchism in the North American context um, is has been a strong interest of mine for many years. Um, yeah. I was radicalized in my early teenage years through the Black Lives Matter movement and then that came to encompass, you know, immigrant justice for me, prison abolition and indigenous sovereignty and then trans liberation. Um, and yeah, I think that based on all of those interest areas, I had heard about Bookchin a bunch and like heard about social ecology as a movement, um, heard about Rojava and like heard about Chiapas and the Zapatistas and being really interested in those projects and what sort of like motivated those projects. So I was really interested to get a theoretical grounding and to actually like read Bookchin and figure out how I felt about like the source material. So that was really fun. Fantastic. Um, so yeah, what what about the course and social ecology as, as we learned it in the course um, has particularly struck you or, or inspired you or affirmed you and the work that you do? Yeah, I think it's really interesting. I think that like the social ecology perspective of like local direct democracy um, has been something that I've been gravitating toward for a long time without a real theoretical grounding. Um, I think like in some ways for me, it's become part of like the theoretical underpinnings of like indigenous sovereignty in this area. And like, just to preface, cause I guess sometimes this is confusing. Like I'm not indigenous to North America, I'm just Egyptian, but like, I'm, I think, really invested in Indigenous sovereignty and participating in allowing that to happen. And like that, to me, is really consistent with the ideas of direct participatory democracy in this area that like Bookchin brings out. Um, and also, like, I just love the naturalist aspect of it. I think that in a lot of leftist political movements, that's something that kind of is like pushed away like you're not supposed to like love nature and really like be excited to be with the world and with other beings and like I felt like a space was opened up somewhat within social ecology for that which felt really affirming. Great fantastic and, and is there um, yeah that resonates with me as well is mm -hmm. there any, is there anything um, 
is there anything about the course um, or, or, or rather the theory as presented, the text or social ecology as a body of theory that you find more challenging or that brings up particular questions or that you're not really happy with or anything? <laughs> <laughs> I think there are two kind of like main interrelated things for me. I think that like the actual body of texts maybe that we read, but like also seems to be pretty canonical to social ecology could really use like more indigenous perspectives and more perspectives from other parts of the world. Because I think that, you know, it's all sort of from an anthropological lens, which I think is very limited. I think that mm -hmm. like a lot of the references to like cultures that are more in harmony with nature and like cultures that are more participatory are from an outsider perspective. And I yeah, think yeah. that something that really needs to happen is for people who can actually speak to those experiences directly to come forward so that we can learn about more material examples of what people are doing and have done. Um, that's kind of a big one for me. And then the other one that was a bit strange, um, it's funny because I especially like this lecture that we had from Professor Chaya Heller, mm. um, which was about like the idea of nature. Um, and one of the things she talked about was like these different conceptions of the relationship between nature and society. Um, and I think I subscribe to the one that she called um, uh, natural monism, which is like the idea that nature and society are the same. Um, and I think that a lot of, at least in my experience, like traditional worldviews from a lot of places in the world kind of do participate in that worldview. And I actually think it's very helpful because like if we're part of nature, then we are responsible to the same rules and the same systems and the same sort of like checks and balances to use a legal term, I guess, um, that other species participate in. And that's for me, at least a very helpful way of understanding how to relate to other beings and other species and things like that. Um, so I was a bit frustrated that they, you know, I think because they have a Marxist tradition, they really wanted to make it dialectical um, and to say like, you know, that there's a dialectical relationship between nature and society in that like there's kind of a push and pull, which I see how that is also a useful um, way of thinking about things. But I think I just found it a bit dismissive of the perspective of, you know, the natural monism, which I think is a lot more relatable to folks also than like dialectical, the, the idea of a dialectic and like can be a good way of thinking about it as well. Yeah, no, that, that I totally agree with you. And it, it, there's a kind of, yeah, intellectual colonialism of just kind of assuming someone like Bookchin, assuming that people, you know, indigenous folk haven't already come up with these ideas. Um, mm. And sort of, yeah, there's a, there's a kind of paternalism there, I guess. Um, mm -hmm. But, but yeah, that can be remedied, I think. Um, and we can choose, we can use what we want, I guess. Um, mm. So yeah, um, so yeah, I, I watched a YouTube video you did <laughs> a, year, a year back. Um, mm. I didn't quite understand the title, but it said that it was responding to something else and I didn't have time to understand what you were responding to. But, mm. but, but part of the title was, um, or the subtitle was "Why do we even need gender?" Mm -hmm. um, and I found it I found it really interesting, uh, and I found it interesting as well how you how you really brought in your personal experience. Um, so I'd, I'd like to sort of jump in the deep end with that, and I've I've written down a few points. Um, yeah. I might hope I might come across as a bit ignorant on this stuff, but um, I think I have got you know a basic idea on on kind of gender constructs and stuff, but um, even though I do identify as male, um, but um, so first, the, one of the first, well, kind of gender fluid edge of male, I guess, I would identify, but um, so one of the first things you said that struck me were, which I, I struck me as quite true, is that white men created, or well, the construct of white men created the construct of white women. Um, mm -hmm. and I, I just wondered if you, and I guess by implication, although you didn't say it at that point in the video, perhaps, by implication, white men have also created non-white women. Is that true? 
And could yeah, you, uh, I think yeah. I think in that in that sort of whole like vein of thought, I'm really indebted to the work of Sylvia Federici. Okay. Um, particularly this book of hers called Caliban and the Witch, which is a absolutely okay. incredible Marxist. Have you read it? I'm I'm right now I'm reading uh, a book by Margaret Atwood called Hag Seed. Cool. Have you, have you heard of it? I, I've heard of her and I've read a lot of her work, but not that one. What okay. is what's that? So it's based on the Tempest. Um cool. and, and strangely, synch uh, synchronistically, um, it's about a guy he's sacked from his job as a theatre director. And then he kind of gets his revenge by putting on a, uh, staging a production of The Tempest inside a prison where he's got a job. <laughs> uh, so it's it's quite fascinating the synchronicities coming about. Um, yeah. But so it's like, a, it's quite clever because like it's a play within a play. So they put on the play within the book, but also the plot of the book is also the plot of the play as well. <laughs> so it's pretty amazing. That's uh, awesome. Yeah, I'd recommend it. Um, but so, sorry. It I really like her work. Um, the Handmaid's Tale and yeah. um, her but, Mad Adam series are both very interesting. Okay, yeah, I've read Handmaid's Tale, but not 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 the other. Um, so mm -hmm. yes, I interrupted. So um, yeah, you, you Sylvia. Sorry. Oh, yeah, on. Sylvia yeah. Federici. So this book, Caliban and the Witch, is like an incredible Marxist historiography of the witch trials as well as the, um, the witch trials that were a very, very important part of early colonialism, but which was not really, um, which is not part of the history that we tell about colonialism. Um, and one of the arguments that Federici makes is that our contemporary gender roles are actually the creation essentially of like the like King James and the and the church during this time period of, of like the late what what's called like the late Middle Ages, um, which essentially led to like these, you know, I think we all kind of know intuitively that the witch trials happened, but we don't really have an explanation, at least I might for me personally and many people I know of like why they happened, like why were hundreds of thousands or maybe even millions of people murdered? Like, it just seems a bit strange. And so Federici kind of contextualizes it. And she says like, one of the barriers to early capitalism was like women's power and the power of queer folks in general, as well as like people's connection with the land, people's ability to like do things for themselves and their sense of communalism. And she talks about how essentially that's what was enforced by the witch trials. And so, you know, when you read this history, it becomes clear that like exactly what you said earlier, even in asking your question, like this process that's begun with the witch trials and has continued now for almost a thousand years is um, basically the creation of the categories of white men white women and brown people and then the forcing of brown people then also to be divided into the categories of men and women. Um, there's also a really fascinating book out there. Um, I don't remember who edited it. It's called Indigenous Men and Masculinities. And one of the things that it discusses as well is how in North American contexts, as well as I believe um, some of the examples are from Australia, New Zealand, and um, some other Pacific islands, how one of the things in early stages of colonialism, um, particularly in the Pacific coast here, um, was that people had to be forced to behave as men and as women. And that was not something that was necessarily the same in other cultures, whether because there were three or four or even five possible genders or because there were different ways of behaving as men and as women. Um, and all of that sort of had to be arranged so that you know, the system of property relations and capitalism and colonialism could be enforced. Yeah, okay, that's, yeah, that's really fascinating. Um, I'm definitely gonna have to look up uh, the writers and the references, the references you brought up, and it, and and something it made me think of um, when you when you first when you started talking about gender constructs coming out of the late Middle Ages, 
bizarrely, well, not bizarrely, I guess quite naturally, I started thinking about the fashion of, uh, of, of people. Uh, well, I, I'm not sure about the different classes, but certainly more aristocratic people in the Middle Ages. Like the difference between the dress of the so-called the men, men and the women was, was mm -hmm. like, you know, it, 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 was, it was very ambiguous, not like today. Like I learned the other day that mm -hmm. high heels, high heels were worn by men, first of all. And like mm. tights and all of that, so yeah, <laughs> it's, quite, it's quite interesting. Um, yeah, definitely. I think that goes to show that like the level of this is like a scientific term that Bookchin would probably approve of the level of like sexual dimorphism that we expect now yeah. is not even like consistent across human culture. No. You know what I mean, like we've been socialized for the past like few hundred years to believe that there are like very strong tendencies toward one or the other particular way of behaving where like yeah. you know like yeah I, I think that also shows that like gender is a collection of different things like now we think of clothing as a strong indicator of gender but back then they probably didn't probably then they thought of many other things as indicators of gender yeah yeah it's interesting because I've been interviewing some Myanmese um, citizens as uh, part of the civil disobedience movement against the military mm -hmm. coup in Myanmar. And, mm -hmm. and, and in Myanmar, the, the men wear long, you could call them skirts. So, and and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm quite comfortable wearing, you know, those kind of clothes. But I think for me, it's where, where I fall down, I guess you could say where I fall down is that I, I'm happy wearing stuff like that in the house, but when I go outside, I guess, because I don't feel like I'm in a liberated area, I'd rather do without the hassle of, mm -hmm. so I just conform to, to male clothes, um, which I guess is, it may, I know I, I understand that I'm perpetuating oppressive norms in a way. <laughs> um, um, so yeah, I mean, going, going a bit deeper still, if you don't mind. Yeah, um, of course. Since, since you did bring it up in your video, you, you actually talked about how you grew up socialized as a Muslim Arab girl in mm -hmm. Egypt. Mm -hmm. um, and you talk about the strict division between the genders. Um, mm -hmm. um, I, I wondered if you would be interested. I mean, you know, you obviously don't have to be too personal if you don't want to be, but be interested in explaining the psychological journey um, from where you were there as a girl looking back, socialized as a girl to where you are now. Um, mm. and, al and also maybe bringing in the physical journey of Egypt to Canada. Like, does it help? <laughs> like, how do those journeys relate? Yeah, it's kind of interesting. I, I've always been a traveling person ever since I was a child. I actually was born in the US, even though oh. I grew up in Egypt. So like I've moved back and forth several times. Okay. Um, but yeah, I think actually like one thing that having such an intensely gender segregated childhood enabled me to do was actually figure out that I was trans much sooner. <laughs> I think like when like I don't know like Egypt is a relatively secular country compared to most of what we would consider like the Middle East yeah. um, and I you know it was interesting because both my mother and my grandmother are doctors and so I lived in a relatively like feminist or at least like nominally feminist family and so I was exposed to the idea that like people could deviate from like very strict gender norms pretty early on but like often in my school environment, which was religiously tinged, like even like socializing with boys was considered inappropriate. So like my, <laughs> I feel like if I was allowed to have like male friends as a child and like do boy stuff and like had a co-ed education, I might've spent longer thinking like, oh, maybe I'm just a tomboy. But like it was very clear to me in a context where everything was like, girl, this, girl, this, girl, this, that I was like, this is definitely not for me. Like, I'm absolutely certain. Um, and then basically we moved to the US when I was 12. Um, I grew up in Southern California, um, oh, okay. outside of San Diego. 
Um, and it was pretty interesting. I came out when I was in high school as trans, um, as a trans man at the time. I think now I would describe myself more as non-binary, though I still use he and him pronouns. Okay. Um, but yeah, I came out when I was 14. I was the first outwardly trans person at my high school. Though I have to say, I was hugely indebted to the fact that there were openly gay teachers at my high school. I think that that was something that's become available in my lifetime that like many queer folks of previous generations didn't have. And it definitely, you know, like opened the doors of safety for me quite a bit, though like ultimately my family is incredibly transphobic and continue to be so to this day. Really? Um, which ultimately led to me moving up to Canada um, for, my law, for my undergraduate degree. And then I went back to the US for a bit for law school and then, uh, now I'm here. <laughs> uh, my partner and I ended up basically just moving back because of COVID and personal family circumstances. But uh, I'm psyched to be back. The Pacific Northwest is fun. Great, great. Well, I'm sorry to hear about yeah your family not being accepting. Um, <laughs> um, yeah. So thanks for that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I wonder. I wonder if. So okay. So uh, earlier today. I mean. I took it quite lightly. I guess I used it as a promotional tool, really. Um, mm -hmm. But I sent some tweets about International Women's Day, and and actually the first tweet I sent was, "Let's something about let's end capitalism, because mm -hmm. gender oppression under capitalism, something like that." But so I guess, um, and and part of me is skeptical of the whole idea of International Women's Day because. Yeah, I mean, I don't know if you're aware that today is supposed to be International Women's mm -hmm. Day. And I wonder what, like bearing in mind the whole conversation we just had, um, do you think it's a completely useless idea? <laughs> I mean, I think like, uh, similarly to you, I feel like these kinds of like days, whoever decides that these days happen, like I just find out about them through social media and like other people posting about them. So like my main question about that kind of stuff is like, does it do anything? Like what, what is the impact at all? I think to, to the extent that like it allows people to promote other stuff, it can be useful. Yeah. But yeah, and I think like, I don't know, I, I'm relatively familiar with some stuff that's going on in the UK. And I know that like in the UK's political environment, like there's definitely a tension right now between like pub, people who are proclaiming themselves publicly to be feminists and like trans folks. Um, and I think that that tension is really non-existent. Like, <laughs> I don't think I've ever met a trans person who wasn't a feminist, who wasn't like invested in women's liberation and wasn't invested in, you know, like gender parity because like, you know, um, I think this is like a concept within black feminist thought, but like, we all believe that like we are not free until everyone is free, right? The whole idea is that like if cis women have better conditions, it probably will help trans folks. But the opposite is even more true. If trans folks have better conditions, cis women will have so much better conditions because for us to have everything that we need, everything that they need also has to be achieved. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, I mean, it brings me to another point you made in the video. It was nice. It was nice to see that you included that that masculinity is harmful for self-identified men as as well as everyone else. And um, I really felt that thing of you saying about um, the, the the pressure to be a provider. I, I don't I don't you know I don't feel like that these days but I have certainly felt that pressure in the past um, I mean I I'm quite comfortable now that I'm not very good at making money I'm just I'm just not, <laughs> <laughs> I'm just not. <laughs> but um, I just sort of scrabble around trying to get work when I can where I can um, I'm very I'm very picky I'm very particular <laughs> um, about you know well I am and I'm not you know sometimes I just don't mind who I work with if it's just for a couple of days a week 
but if it's for more than that then but yeah but no that's really nice to see that included um so yeah i'm just going to repeat because I, I i found this a bit harsh it, it might be harsh but true so i'm mm. just going to repeat what you said um so this is what you're you're saying to people who identify as men you said you getting you getting to have a gender comes at the expense of your emotional well-being it comes at the cost of sexual violence for women and queer people and it comes at the cost of discrimination against women and queer people and mm. um you know i can say that i identify as male or 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 on the sort of gender fluid edge of male um or or sometimes non-binary maybe sometimes male i don't know but i mean generally i'm quite happy to identify as male and um uh but you saying that it kind of i could kind of see that it's true on one level on the ultimate level it is true what you're saying is true um but i don't know it's kind of like I guess it, there's a resonance with social ecology of, of, of it might be something to aim for, that genderlessness might be something to aim for. Um, but with society being as it is now, um, how useful is it to, um, I mean, you're expressing something very profound and valid and everything, but is there a more practical as well level, a more practical level I mean, you know, like you identify as, as well, you say non-binary, but also use he, him. Mm -hmm. So I guess, you know, I guess you must be okay with me using he, him. Yeah. Um, so yeah, of course. I think like, if, if I could cut in, like, yeah. I really like your comparison to social ecology. I think like one thing to point out is that like gender abolition, which is the philosophy that I personally subscribe to is okay. like, a not embraced by all trans people and b like it is definitely a radical utopian philosophical form in the sense that like of course like gender abolitionists understand that like we want there to be no gender eventually and we want to take direct action as well as policy and educational steps to make that happen and we understand that like people live under gender now right like that's a real thing like we all have to interact with each other um <laughs> just a few a few minutes before this conversation like i i was on the phone with the prison administrator asking about one of our inside members and the guy was like calling me ma'am and like you know if i was a totally liberated gender abolitionist it wouldn't bother me that that dude called me ma'am but it's right. definitely one of my top three least favorite things in life <laughs> Okay, yeah. <laughs> you know, like, for sure, I totally relate to what you're saying. And like, yeah, I think also like, the important thing to distinguish is gender identity and gender expression. Um, you know, like, a lot of people I think are frightened that gender abolitionists want to abolish gender expression, which is not what we want, you know, like, we can say that gender expression is like the way you dress and the way you speak and your posture and your haircut and your pronouns and all of this stuff and like yeah. you know i feel like people think that trans people like <laughs> they want everyone to have like shitty undercuts and wear the same like <laughs> you know what i mean like it's obviously not what we want like there was this meme going around that like people that like actually the easiest way to spot a non-binary person is because they dress like an acid trip circus clown elementary school teacher. Like we love like <laughs> color and expression and creativity and how you present yourself in the world. Like that's actually what we're trying to promote, you know, as opposed to people feeling like, you know, um, there's only two ways to express yourself. So it's not really about like, will will gender abolitionists allow you to continue using he, him pronouns, but that like gender abolitionists want it to be a nor completely normal in the world for someone who like has long hair and wears dresses, just to use like a particularly reductive example, to continue using he, him pronouns, as well as the ability as someone who 
is you know assigned male at birth to be like actually i am i am enough of a woman that i want to do all of this other stuff and to allow that to happen too you know like i think that the other flip side of that is that some people are afraid particularly because some of the folks who are violently transphobic also identify themselves as gender abolitionists people think that gender abolition somehow invalidates trans identity and that's not true either like we just want autonomy like for me abolition gender abolition prison abolition police abolition um you know the abolition of the state it's all part of like a broader anarchist framework for liberation and like that's all, all of those concepts are about the freedom of people to do what they need and to be what they want and to like express themselves and have autonomy. And it's definitely never about placing more restrictions on people. Okay, that, that's a really incredible response. And, and um, I'm gonna definitely have to research uh, gender abolitionism. And, and um, yeah, if you can send me any links or- Totally, yeah, I'll track some stuff down for sure. Right, great. Um, so yeah, moving on to um, your work with the organization Black and Pink. I did have a very, very brief look on the website. I see that they came about in 2005. Um, and obviously I gave a, a very short description in, when I introduced you, but um, I thought I would leave it to you to explain more about what they do and also what you do with them. Totally. Yeah. So the organization that I work for is um, it's basically like the national center of this hub of pen pals and networks of outside and inside folks writing to each other, advocating for each other, um, helping each other with, you know, a variety of different mutual aid projects. Um, we mostly focus on being in solidarity with folks who are in prisons, jails, and immigration detention centers throughout the US who self-identify as um, LGBT, um, queer, intersex, asexual, two-spirit plus, or HIV positive, um, which um, even uh, we've generally experienced that HIV positive people, whether or not they actually are gay, often are treated the same way that gay people are. So it was useful to, to kind of like encompass that. And I think that's a big part of the movement for um, gay liberation that's not really talked about, especially because, you know, a lot of people think that HIV was like something that happened in the 80s, but like any communities, particularly in the US South and particularly among Black communities, not to mention all of the folks who are in South Africa and Mozambique and all of the other countries of Southern Africa who are still living through the AIDS epidemic. Um, and anyway, so then my work with Black and Pink is mostly to do with the Inside Member Response Program, which is our attempt basically to address the huge, huge, huge outpouring of requests from our Inside Members for just like legal advice, support and information because, you know, um, a lot of LGBT folks in prison experience severe abuse and torture and, you know, really horrible conditions. And, you know, a lot of our pen pals on the outside were becoming overwhelmed with these requests. And a lot of the folks on the inside, like just were not able to access services. And so basically like what I've been doing is kind of helping folks navigate um, what legal resources there are, how to bring their own kinds of legal claims, teaching them about their own legal claims and what kind of rights they have, and sort of helping to build like a legal mutual aid network, which sounds like a totally like um, incongruous thing, but yeah. that's the project. <laughs> yeah. Now that sounds amazing. Um, so wh when you when you said um, uh, people who are LGBTQ. Oh yeah, two, oh two S. Thanks for explaining. I didn't I didn't know what that stood for. Now I know. Um, yeah. I, I have I have heard the term two spirit, but I didn't put it together when I saw two S. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So so when when such people are, are experiencing abuse inside the system, is that at the hands of um, heteronormative uh, like other inmates, or at the hands of guards, or both equally? Uh -huh. Yeah. Both. Just like everything. I think like, you know, like there's so many interrelated things. I think like, first of all, like um, 
queer and trans folks are deliberately targeted for incarceration. So there are very disproportionate numbers of them in there. Um, often okay. they are, um, if you are, I don't know, this is like pertaining to the US. I don't know if this applies in all places, but in the US often, if you are picked up for um, consensual sex work, you can be charged as a sex offender, which means that you will be incarcerated with rapists. Um, so that happens to a lot of trans women um, that, um, you know, like people experience racism, um, people don't have access to the medical care they need. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I don't know what to tell you. Like, uh, it's funny cause I grew up in Egypt and like, you know, when you, grow up in an African country, you have an awareness that your police department is corrupt and that your jail system involves torture and that somehow Europe and North America are like beyond that. But then like, I think that's why, you know, like I became so involved in the movement for black lives is because like as a child, I believed that it would be better in America and it turned out to be worse. Yeah. Um, and, you know, like, yeah, I mean, people really just experience torture. Like I was giving a talk to some public defenders last week and basically I was just saying to them, like your responsibility is to make sure that queer and trans people don't see the inside of a jail cell because unless they literally murdered someone, what they will go through will, and even if they did murder someone in many circumstances, because maybe it was self-defense, um, what they go through in that prison cell will never, ever, ever, ever be proportional to what they did. Sure. Okay. Well, that, that sounds pretty horrific. Uh, yeah. I'll, I'll certainly do a bit more research. Um, okay. So yeah, moving on a little bit. So I looked at some of your artwork and graphic design work. I really, really enjoyed some of the, some of those uh, bits. I'll, I'll link to that underneath the video. Um, and, and, in, and in one of your little uh, graphic um, pieces, it, it's about prison abolition. And, and I just want to read, I wrote it down. So you wrote, and I'm not sure whether these are your words or from somewhere else, but, it's, but you wrote abolition democracy. Abolition democracy requires the creation of all the social protections police were designed to replace. Let us reimagine our schools as places for messy radical learning. Let us house and feed all our relations. We can care for each other without the police. Um, so I think that's a great vision to have. Could you expand on that vision in light of your profession as a lawyer um, <laughs> and, and your research into avenues for abolition using the law? Because I, I like, like you just said a few moments back, it seems strange to me that you could find a route through the law to abolition. Um, <laughs> so may, I don't know that that I guess that would relate to your black and pink work as well. Yeah, so um, th those are my words, but the concept of abolition democracy was created by Angela Davis. Oh, I know uh, she is, yeah. Yeah, so, you know, this is kind of something that she talks about in her book, Abolition Democracy, um, which is basically that like, prisons and policing in many places in the world are designed as remedies to social problems such as poverty, such as um, public health issues like drug use and lack of access to mental health care. Um, and so one of the things that is necessary as part of abolition is to create the services that are necessary to like make people, to, to, to take people away from prisons and to, to divert them. Um, and I think, yeah, like for me as an anarchist, that mostly involves like creating meth, like dual power and creating other structures, but also intervening into the system to say, actually, you can't handle this. You need to do something else. So um, for example, there is this legislation that's being discussed at the US federal level um, that was proposed by the Movement for Black Lives. It's called the Breathe Act in reference to the murder of George Floyd. Um, and one of the things that it says is it says, you know, we're going to help give grants to the government for certain infrastructure changes if they agree to divert, you know, such and such groups of people, such as, for example, like trans folks who are particularly vulnerable to violence or, 
you know, um, people who have drug charges that are relatively minor or like youths or people with mental health issues out of the system entirely, like not to another government social service, which we understand can also be coercive and violent um, because, you know, it particularly in North America, but in many places like child protective services is an agent of genocide. And also, you know, like mental health care is often a worse form of incarceration that you can never get out of um, if you are not in there voluntarily. And so we, we want to essentially pressure lawmakers and legal stakeholders to just take people out of the system and say, actually, this will work great for you. Now you have all this money to like, build a bridge or a fancy new building or whatever, you know, people who like a government get excited about, you know, as long as people can take care of their needs inside the community. Because I think for me as an abolitionist, one of the key things is having people be able to address their issues and their needs in community and with the folks around them, the folks who are you know, understand their social conditions, understand what's going on in their lives and are able to genuinely help them and follow up with them and to be in participation with them. And for them to be, you know, in the case where someone has done something harmful to someone, um, for that person as well to be able to make right with the other person or at least with the community after that's happened. And I think that these are things that are legal prison court and jail systems don't even like try to make happen there's some like weird fringe attempts but ultimately that's not really the goal it's not the goal of police or prisons to make people not commit crimes again in fact they make money off of you committing crimes um it's not the goal of police or prisons to make you not go to jail again because again they make money off of that and it's not their goal to make you a better or happier person. They just see, you know, a homeless person, someone who is using drugs, someone who's using having a mental health crisis, someone who is forced to engage in an illegal industry because of the conditions of their life and the discrimination that they face. And they think, oh, you're not supposed to do that. So you're in trouble now. Let's go put you in the bad boy corner instead of like trying to change the conditions of that person's life that made that happen. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so is one of the is one of the sort of legal or judicial i guess avenues do, do, do you ever make connections or think about making connections with with judges and and sort of educating judges um about the issues is that like is that one way or I think, yeah, I think that's definitely interesting work to do. I personally hate talking to government officials yeah. Um, so I personally try to stay as far away from that stuff as possible. Um, it's kind of interesting. I think it is really important. I used to work for an organization that actually provided legal services to folks who were incarcerated, like actually represented them in court. And it was hugely important in that context for us to, you know, like form positive relations with Department of Corrections staff and form positive relations with, yeah, judges and even like prosecutors and people who are on parole boards and stuff. And I mean, I think that is important, but it's kind of like from an abolitionist perspective, I'm kind of like, well, you just shouldn't be there. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? And like, I, you know, it's kind of interesting. Like, I think a lot of, you know, I think I definitely participate in a lot of like radical utopian politics. And one of the shortcomings can be like, I love doing direct action. I love participating in mutual aid, but like, the incremental reforms that like many people believe will be necessary for the in-between. Like yeah. I personally am just not interested in okay. participating, you know? <laughs> That's fair enough. Yeah, okay. Um, <laughs> but yeah, actually, I, I I don't know if there's if there's much more to say about it because you, you, you kind of have answered it a little bit already. Um, but yeah, you, you've already identified as anarchist and, and into dual power, obviously. Um, that that's a theme in social ecology dual power as well. So I just mm -hmm. wanted, if, wondered if you had any more thoughts on uh, how abolition relates to social ecology. Um, but I guess we've kind of covered it already. I think, but I don't know. If, I don't know if, if you do want to say anything more about that. You don't have to. Yeah, I think like the abolitionist tradition, particularly the like 
the the like North American abolitionist tradition, which sort of draws a direct line between like seeking the abolition of slavery and then seeking the abolition of police prisons and ultimately the you know for many for many of us the state. Um, I think that that framework has actually been a lot more useful to me in my life than social ecology. I think because you know kind of like I was saying in my critiques like. I think that the perspectives of people who are marginalized, who experience the most poverty and the experience the most brutality have some of the most useful things to offer us as theoretical frameworks. But I think that like many of those things are very aligned. Like it's very big within abolitionist concepts to create like community organizations that substitute for government institutions. And even though they might not necessarily use the term dual power, that's yeah. obviously what they're participating in. And right. you know, when organizations participate in community meetings where they come to a consensus before anything is done, that is direct participatory democracy, but it doesn't necessarily use that terminology. Mm -hmm. And so I think one of the reasons I embrace abolition and I'm often skeptical of like academic philosophy traditions is that it's often just not within the terminology that regular people use and that's relatable to them and often is not directly connected enough to their circumstances to be practically useful. And I think one thing that's kind of interesting about that is like by embracing all of these different traditions like abolition and indigenous sovereignty and trans liberation and all of this other stuff, it kind of creates like that, um, the like diversity and like the pluriversal perspective that I think social ecology values. Um, so I think it's like, all of this is to say, like, I think that a lot of people are doing social ecology without calling it that. And I think that that's something really cool to see. And also something that I would hope that the social ecology movement that would like elevate. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, and I guess uh, abolitionists who might be a little bit more practically minded than maybe some some people who, who are read up on social ecology might on the other side be able to benefit from like more of a theoretical like yeah o grounding or, o o or overview yeah i guess or, or <laughs> yeah yeah um okay well yeah i mean i i just wanted to touch i think we're almost there it's been really fascinating like yeah yeah um and you're teaching me a lot um but maybe last of all we could just touch on you say that you said that you're interested in you like to spend time outside and like with nature and growing stuff and and i wondered whether part of that was about i know it is for me i guess is having a very grounded sense of identity that's nothing to do with gender it's just um mm. it's just it's just um, the earth and and trees and um is that part of it for you i think that's huge I, something i've been working toward putting together a poetry collection actually exploring this idea and um something that you said earlier also made me think of this is like the idea that like gender identity and like our rigid notions of gender presentation only really hold when you're around other people um, I recently read a fascinating blog entry by this person who is a trans woman and she was describing how she normally obsessively removes all of her body hair so that she feels feminine, but she realized in quarantine that that wasn't necessary for her to feel feminine, it was necessary for other people to treat her as feminine and that, you know, like outside of the context of other people, she wanted and needed different things for her gender presentation. And I think that exactly like you said, being outside in nature and being in relationship with other beings and, you know, like interacting with birds and interacting with deer and interacting with flowers and earthworms and stuff like that, just, just like attunes us to a perspective that I think is a lot more helpful mentally and emotionally as well as in terms of orienting our priorities politically yeah. than 
you know, all of these digitized interactions that we often have now. And I think like, yeah, like you said, like my partner and I spent this weekend putting up um, the fence for our vegetable garden because we moved into this house a few months ago and um, we're putting our starts out hopefully in the next few weeks. Right. And, you know, I think that really interesting ethical questions come up when you're discussing like, oh, we need this fence to keep out deer, but we have to be careful because we don't want to keep out birds and we don't want to keep out such and such types of bugs. And, you know, I think that those are also sophisticated social ecology questions. And I really liked um, the lecture of Grace Gershini yeah. about that and kind of like the orientation to like being in the garden. Because I think, you know, a lot of a lot of values and a lot of well-being comes out of, you know, what you know, I, I'm kind of I'm kind of interested in how social ecology was trying to get us to stop using the word nature. I kind of like that. I feel like I would like to reframe it as like participating in our relationships that are already around us, whether we ignore them or not. Great. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. <laughs> Okay, well, yeah, I have, I have to shoot now, but um, thank you so much um, for joining us, Aaron. That was really, really fascinating. Um, and um, I'll be putting plenty of links underneath the video. And yeah, I'll, I'll be asking you, contacting you for some information, lots of information and stuff, so. Um, yeah, no worries. It's been super nice to chat. And yeah, I'm sure we'll, we'll chat lots again. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure. Thanks for having me on. No problem, no problem at all.